Bugle, audio newspaper for a visual world. Hello, Buglers, and welcome to issue 4191 of the Bugle, audio newspaper for a visual world. I'm Andy Zaltzman. It is the 19th of April, 2021, and the world, I'm pleased to announce, is no longer going to hell in a handcart but only because the handcart fell apart because the contract to make the handcart was given to a company with no handcart making experience but friends in high places. So now we're just <laughs> stuck in between the earth and hell without even the prospect of the reassuringly predictable moral consistency of hell to cling to. Uh, to discuss our current predicament in between these two worlds of existence, joining me this week, not for the first time and for the first time respectively, from... Uh, also, respectively, ten and a half thousand miles away as the crow flies, or seven thousand miles away as the squirrel burrows in Melbourne, Australia, and about eight miles away as the car drives, as long as it doesn't get lost. And with respectively zero and two unowatts, uh, or vice versa, it is, uh, or it are, or they are, Alice Fraser, and for the first time on the bugle, Chris Addison. Hello, hello, hello. Andy. Hello, Chris. Welcome. Uh, Welcome to the show. It's great, great, uh, great to have you on after well, uh, all these years. Long time listener, first time caller. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'd just like to say hello to everyone in Class Four B at Broad Oak Juniors. And uh, can you please dedicate your next pun to my mum and dad and anyone else who knows me? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, Chris, uh, I think you've just revealed the bugle secret, which is that uh, the guests are not booked. We just randomly call and <laughs> luckily That's get it. through to Andy Zaltzman or not, as the case may be. On oh, my very. Yeah. Very busy phone line. Um, uh, so, uh, Chris, when we, we first worked together, well, almost twenty years. It's ago twenty years. Twenty years. I figured it out. It's two thousand. It's after we we first talked about it after the two thousand one Edinburgh Festival. That's when we started right. to plan things. Yeah. Yes. And I then, wasn't yes, even so we, born then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a a radio show called called the Department with um, another guy who's. Uh, whose name I forget. Uh, Sun Loser. John, That's how I think John, of him. John something or other. Um, <laughs> and, um, well, but it's great to have you have you on, uh, 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 finally. I mean, how for, we've, I mean it's, it's been... It's been we then did um, Seven Day Sunday. Oh, yeah, stroke, that's right, yes. Yes, we did uh, Seven Day Sunday. <laughs> The uh, much lamented uh, seven day Sunday. Of, when uh, was that though? Was that I have a feeling that was like twenty twelve or something? It was well, we definitely covered the twenty ten general election because I remember that being a tough show the week after. God, that. yeah, you you and I had to sit in a room with John Pino, who every so often would look at us, and then we'd have to say something to stony <laughs> silence. Oh, yeah, well, that was election night, wasn't it? That was election night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was um, grim. All of these fond reminiscences are uh, uh, sort of casting into the shadow. My anniversary today, Andrew, What's that? our oh, four-year right. anniversary was yesterday of uh, me coming on the Bugle for the first time at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Indeed. So um, that was that was four four years. Did you say? Yep, four, four years. Four Time years. flies when you're having fun. I mean, that is an. Entire... I must have been having fun because I didn't expect to be this old this quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you've been not, involved. Not that I'm old. I'm just older than I expected to be by now. You know. So, so to put this in context, uh, I've, I've yeah, been working with Chris on and off for five Olympic cycles, and you've been part of the Bugle for a, now an entire Olympic cycle. That's the the standard of time measurements that um, I like to keep on this show. How are you going to deal with the fact that Olympic cycles are are now not quite? I mean, they're I an don't indeterminate think about length, it, Chris. aren't they? <laughs> Uh, this They'll average be- out. They will average out at four. That, that's 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 all I will cling to. As a as a cricket statistician, averages are, are your main currency, aren't they? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, Chris. And you know, I ignore the bit in between uh, the cancellation of the Olympic Games in what three hundred AD or whatever until they were reborn. Otherwise, the average gets completely out of kilter. <laughs> um, so we are recording on the nineteenth of April. Well, another important anniversary, Alice, uh, seventeen seventy. Uh, Captain James Cook. Uh, first sighted the eastern coast of what is now Australia. Uh, so how is that working out? Uh, it depends who you ask, Andy Zoltzman. <laughs> if you ask the people who were here before he arrived, not well. Uh, not well uh, Not well at all. But, you know, we're British. We tend not to ask <laughs> these questions of people who might give the wrong answer. I mean, also for the people who arrived yes. uh, shortly after him, the convicts, not good for them either. Just yes, neither side of that equation was happy for the most part. <laughs> for, for, but at, at the point that, you know, that's that's true at the time, you know, there was a great deal of misery, bloodshed, the forcible taking of land. But all that time later, Tim Tams. So, you know, swings and very much roundabouts. Yes, indeed. 
and the ashes Very as true. well. So, and the ashes. You know, that wouldn't have happened were it not for James Cook looking at the right side of his boat on uh, this day in 1770. <laughs> um, as always, uh, a section of the bugle is going in the bin. This week, April. April uh, is in the bin, a special April section. Uh, scientists uh, have discovered this exciting news for the month of April that contrary to the claims of the former Team GB poetry celeb and Nobel Prize winner T.S. Eliot, April is not in fact the cruelest month. Uh, monthly logicians have found that in fact April is on average only the fifth cruelest month of the year, although they do acknowledge that this may have changed since the advent of social media when anonymous abuse merchants are most active during the dark winter months. Um, and this, all, we also investigate in our April section, could April be ditched post-Brexit to enable Britain to get to summer a month before the rest of the European Union? Or could it even be postponed to the end of November to add some spring optimism to the difficult later months of the year? I don't know. I don't care, but at least we have the choice now. <laughs> and uh, finally, we investigate allegations that April is a hoax. New evidence suggests that the month didn't even exist in earlier times and was a hoax concocted in the early days of ancient Rome. And we ask, if it is a hoax, what should be there instead? What are we being denied? What is April hiding? That section in the bin. <laughs> Top story now. Holy shit, the world is doomed. Now, it's... Uh, I mean, Chris, it's great to have you uh, on a show in a week where it does seem that the world is doomed. I mean, admittedly, that could be any week uh, at, at the moment, or indeed uh, for most of the last few thousand years of human history. But, I mean, it has been uh, you know, an incredible week. NASA has flown a, flown a drone on Mars. Big whoop, it's still a pointless shithole. Sorry, I mispronounced that. Shithole. Uh, it's an old Jewish term for uninhabitable <laughs> desert, which also explains the 40-year wonder. No way, Moses. We're not living here. It's a she thought it. Uh, football is being torn asunder. Coronavirus is varianting the shit out of itself. Uh, please give it up, Crownhead. You've made your point. Those words could also apply to more than one story this week. And uh, an explosive new allegation has suggested that uh, voting in the 1974 Eurovision Song Contest might not have been entirely <laughs> meritocratic. In short, as the French would say, plus ça change, plus c'est la fucking même fucking fuckers, fucking tout la fucking everything up. Um, so uh, let's begin with the Ukraine uh, situation. As we speak, a summit is being held. Uh, they always work. Um, and uh, there, there are tensions. There are tensions uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, Chris, I know you're a massive fan of uh, Cold War nostalgia. Huge. Um, uh, are, you, are you enjoying this? Well, uh, am I enjoying it? I don't think enjoying is, uh, is the right word for, for any of these things. I do think uh, Vladimir Putin... Uh, who I'm a, a big watcher of, Vladimir, before this week, uh, perhaps best known as the inventor of spaghetti putinesca, which is a delicious <laughs> pasta sauce of tomato, garlic, onions, novichok, and just a little bit of thyme, uh, just to cut through. Yes, right. Andy? I mean, I think you might be the first of the co-hosts I've had on the show whose lead-off gag has been a pun. And oh, <laughs> well, yeah, when in only, Rome. I can only, well, exactly, I can only <laughs> admire that. Well, welcome to the show. <laughs> Yeah, maybe there must have been something very subconscious going on there, wasn't there? <laughs> Nonetheless. But saying that Putin... When in Rome, wear a mask. <laughs> they haven't got it under control yet. Saying that Putin is known for aggressive behaviour, um, and he is uh, a, a little like saying that Ludwig van Beethoven is known for writing the odd whistleable tune. It's absolutely <laughs> relentless with him. Cannot get enough of the old aggression. Things have gone far enough. This is what I think. So, and so today, I, I, I think... I would like to pitch to you that you start the bugle campaign to get Vladimir Putin laid. Uh, he's been displaying precisely <laughs> the kind of escalation in attention-seeking behaviour you associate with drunk young men who haven't copped off in a provincial nightclub at one o'clock in the morning. He's appeared topless on a horse, didn't get laid. <laughs> he annexed the Crimean Peninsula, didn't get laid. So he sent hired assassins to point half of Salisbury, didn't get laid. This massive build-up of armaments at the Ukrainian border that is uh, that he's absolutely desperate to let fly is essentially a very threatening metaphor as to how he's feeling right now. Somebody, and it doesn't matter who, Andy, somebody needs to f Vladimir Putin stat. Right. That is <laughs> okay. I mean, so, so essentially, he's part of the sort of incel movement. That's what you're saying. Vla Vladimir Putin is. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I think the man, the man is clearly the, the amount of aggression being built up by by that man. Yeah, I, I mean, Alice has got. He uh, certainly put a lot of people in cells. <laughs> Fuck off! This is a, a so that's a funny start to the show. Uh, this is. I, have you done work. a pun yet, Andy? Is, is it no, is it I'm possible that the moment. two people on the on the show without you, but I've not been, you, have done a pun? I've been clean for a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> you can stop at any time, can't you? 
<laughs> no, no, just don't, don't put temptation it's in the way. the fate of the master to watch the students outgrow him. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's ridiculous that NATO doesn't have a plan for f***ing Putin. This is the, the tensions <laughs> eased last week after Joe Biden called him because I, th- I suspect that Putin thought that was a booty call, basically. Right. But Biden is relatively okay. old and frail and he might not survive that task. So the, the obvious, <laughs> oh, the obvious candidate for the job is Boris Johnson, a man who is famously led by his penis or before Dominic <laughs> Cummings resigned, led by his two penises. Even he might balk at a night at the Kremlin. Uh, Merkel's resigning, so there's no way she's going to do it. The Austrian right. Chancellor, Sebastian Kurz, good-looking young man, but he's got a bad leg. Uh, Pedro Sanchez, who is coincidentally... Pedro Sanchez, Andy, is coincidentally Prime Minister of Spain and winner of the 2021 Senior Global Politician, whose name sounds most like someone made it up as a Lazy Stereotype Award, <laughs> beating French, fi- min- uh, French Finance Minister Amélie Arroyon, Italian <laughs> Foreign Secretary Giovanni, hey, what's the matter with you? And British Leader of the House of Commons, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Anyway, Pedro Sanchez can't Netflix and chill because uh, he gets an allergic reaction to caviar. So I suggest that yeah. NATO go the Murder on the Orient Express route and wait right. till if Putin falls asleep and then they all f*** him and right. maybe we'll get some peace. <laughs> that is my, my pitch. Right. I mean, Chris, this is a terrible preset. I mean, I, to be rating the f- ability of various polit- political leaders, yep. I think, is a disrespectful to the offices which they hold and the kind of horrible university lives that they they had. Uh, I blame first Justin Trudeau and then Disraeli for putting f- ability on the t- on the table. Disraeli, right. and, Disraeli, oh, dreamboat, banging, really, absolute dreamboat. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, each to their own, I guess, but you know. Who wouldn't? Uh, Alice, I mean, obviously Australia uh, on military tenderhooks over the the Ukraine situation because so often, um, you know, wars in the Crimea um, lead, well, within, well, I mean, on on, on previous uh, previous evidence within twenty years to uh, to the start of an international sporting rivalry, if uh, if I can remember my nineteenth <laughs> century history correctly, the start of Anglo Australian cricket. What's uh, what's the reaction to the the Crimea situation? Uh, down under uh we're enjoying it very much uh fashion moves in cycles andy and i saw some slap bands in the shops the other day some hyper color t-shirts and it's nice to know that nuclear weapons are back on the table as a negotiation tactic of choice uh i think it's a it's a beautiful thing to witness right. these things coming back round again does fashion move in cycles because I, I think you know when when it comes to me and fashion that that cycle crashed into a disused quarry uh, <laughs> when i was about three years old and has never been seen well, since. Yeah, this you know the this uk ukraine president vladimir zelensky is saying that it needs these nukes to defend against russia if it's not allowed into nato and uh if I'd known that this level of strong arm tactics was effective when I was in high school, I mightn't have been so ostracized uh, by the cool groups. You know, in, in a girl's school, Andy, I don't know if you know this, in a girl's school, you can never rule through love, only through fear. Uh, no, I, I'm a bit out of the loop on, uh, on girls' schools, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I mean, the Russian military have, uh, have been moving towards the uh, eastern uh, Ukraine border um, and it's prompted a stern international reaction with the UN passing resolution 2154 uh, which states um, uh, can you please not do that uh, and uh, an upgraded uh, an upgraded statement uh, also come from NATO uh, saying I mean seriously now really that's enough uh, if this carries on we will have a serious discussion about not awarding any more Olympics and World Cups to Russia for at least the next year so the international community is starting to, to sound a, a bit uh, a, a bit stronger, y- Ukraine has warned Russia of painful consequences, um, and uh, Joe Biden is ratcheting up sanctions due to uh, Russian influence in, in America, cyber attacks, uh, interfering in elections, in media and business, uh, in Hollywood in the 1950s, and in uh, baseball's <laughs> World Series, controversially won last year by the Moscow Bolsheviks. So, um, I mean, th- also America's th- today threatened consequences. Isn't it called it the World Series if they only wanted American teams in there, Andy? <laughs> uh, um, America's threatened more consequences. I mean, this could be double consequences uh, for Russia. The consequences from Ukraine and America. Um, a, a, love, a beautiful, vague threat consequences. If uh, the jailed opposition leader Alexei Navalny dies behind prison bars, he's reported in a weak state after a, a, a long hunger strike. Mass protests are planned for uh, Wednesday uh, of, of this week. Navalny has been uh, incarcerated for some time now for the crimes of surviving a uh, previous assassination attempt and then with opposition aforethought going back to Russia. So it's um, 
it's uh, well, clearly it's it's hard to be optimistic about uh, any form of uh, Russian military expansionism, but there is some hope from protesters in Prague who I think have taken the strongest action against Putin's government. They have erected a statue outside the Russian em embassy in the Czech capital of a golden toilet, the best kind of toilet, on a special plinth, the best place for any toilet, on which is sitting a naked Vladimir Putin, the best kind of Vladimir Putin, holding a toilet <laughs> brush and a toilet roll, the best things to hold if you want to symbolise the corrupt stench of autocratic monarchy, uh, with his underpants round his ankles, which is emphatically the best place for Vladimir Putin's underpants because it makes it a little harder for him to run away. Um, and uh, also there's a bottle of Novichok nestling in those underpants, which uh, is probably the best thing to use when air freshener simply won't cut the mustard. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it remains to be seen whether the shitting Putin statue will be more effective at constraining the expansionist twattery of the Kremlin from the Kremlin than the international community's mumble threats. But at least it can't be less effective and has the added bonus of being a statue of Vladimir Putin taking a shit with his undies around his ankles. So... Uh, there we go, something to cling to. When it I mean, Andy, this opens up horizons of new uh, new mediums for satire, for satirical expression for me. I'm I'm already planning my next uh, bugle will be done entirely in interpretive dance. <laughs> it's a great audio medium, to be fair. You know, you know of course, that um, uh, Putin is, uh, is, is Russian for a chamber pot. So it's... Uh, <laughs> of course it is. It's... Um, <laughs> no. It's... <laughs> It's entirely in keeping. And it'll be very interesting to see uh, if, uh, when this statue is inevitably removed from outside the Russian embassy, if there are Conservative MPs lining up to say, oh, no, you cannot simply eradicate history by removing a statue. <laughs> Actually, the sculptor has said it doesn't represent uh, Putin specifically. It represents all women. <laughs> um... <laughs> oh, I've forgotten that one. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and a quick uh, quiz question uh, for uh, any buglers who are uh, not fully aware of the situation. Who or what is Ukraine? Is Ukraine A, a form of precipitation featuring small stringed instruments? Is it B, a device for lifting pregnant sheep out of quarries? Uh, is it C, Hugh Crane is a cabinet minister who signed a £2 billion deal with a friend from the tennis club to supply PPE for the NHS, uh, from which all that was delivered was a maxi pack of frozen pita breads with elastic bands stapled to the ends uh, to work as uh, workers <coughs> uh, and a shipping container full of slightly damp Halloween outfits and a handwritten note saying, these should, wo uh, these should work, cheers bud. Or is it D, a large European nation currently concerned about a build-up of Russian troops near its border, especially after Russia nicked a big bit of that country just a few short years ago. Do send your answers to Moscow. There was a fart of a pun in there, Andy. I'm not sure you've ever actually wafted, implied one quite like that before. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a tough day for Chris. Uh, as, a, as a fan of Tottenham Hotspur, we're recording this on Monday. We'll touch more on this story later on, but uh, Jose Mourinho, your... Your own personal messiah has just been sacked and uh, Spurs have uh, emphatically joined the side of all evil with the European Super League. How are you, how are you coping? I mean, uh, part one of those things, you say it's a tough day. It's actually a very nice <laughs> day. Very happy. Uh, part, part two, look, if you're going to be on the side of evil, you just got to hope that evil wins. <laughs> that I is a great feel, film know, tagline. <laughs> I don't follow sports, but whenever I hear that anything has happened in sports, I assume it has to do with sexual assault. <laughs> well, no, this is financial assault, uh, which is um, <laughs> uh, not always the same thing. <laughs> uh, moving on in the holy shit the world is doomed section. Um, well, one of the trendiest things in global news these days is things finally coming to an end after lasting way, way, way longer than was originally hoped and planned due to a series of early mistakes and avoidable political errors. And, uh, well, it's not just COVID that's on that bandwagon. Afghanistan uh, has jumped on it as well. Um, now, I wrote a joke round about 2002, <laughs> uh, hoping for uh, trying to find something positive from the uh, American uh, and British Afghanistan uh, campaign. And I was hoping... I don't remember this joke, uh, Chris, from uh, my, my Back early in the days day. in comedy. It might even have made it into the department, I can't remember. Uh, f hoping for a final answer to the previously unsolved question that has echoed through eternity. If two wrongs don't make a right, how many wrongs do make a right? 
And that was essentially what <laughs> the Afghanistan uh, campaign seemed to be an effort to answer. And here we are, nearly 20 years on, still no answer, and America is abandoning the research project with this intractable question still still hanging in the air. It's going to withdraw all its troops in time for the, uh, oh my f***ing God, we can't let this go on for more than two decades, symbolic 11th of September anniversary. Um, any any positives to come out of the last two decades in Afghanistan for either of you? See, I... I, I... I sort of I understand the problem. I understand the problem for the for the Americans, you know, because sure, sure, Andy, it's it's only been twenty years, yeah. uh, but you want to go before you've outstayed your welcome, don't you? You yeah. for some time now, the Taliban have been making yawning noises and talking about having to be up early for a meeting about how they can stop girls from going to school. While the American military has essentially got its guitar out and started singing bad vampire weekend covers. But to be fair to them, it is difficult. What is the etiquette for leaving a country you've spent two decades occupying with your military? It might be, I thought it might be useful for us at this juncture just to go over the social rules for invading and occupying another country. So First of all, it's important to remember that when you receive an invitation, you absolutely should not RSVP, as this completely gives away any elements of surprise to your invasion. Uh, in terms of arrival times, try to arrive within 15 minutes of the stated start time and not, say, a decade after the radicalised jihadists you funded for years have kicked the Soviet <laughs> Union out of their country. That's just embarrassing for everybody, and it makes it very tricky for the host to know when to put the casserole in the oven. The issue of what to take for your hosts... That's, well, that's a the joy of a one. casserole, isn't it, Chris? You don't need to time it right. I'm you telling just you. Let it sit. I'm telling you, Andy. By the time the US had turned up, that was nothing but ash at the bottom of a Le Creuset. <laughs> That's what that was. What to take your host is a tricky one. You don't want to be bringing the traditional bottle of wine to an Islamist regime. So what might be a reasonable substitute? Well, according to Debrett's Guide to Etiquette, anything up to a trillion dollars in military equipment and personnel and tens of thousands of lives is considered reasonable. Um, another issue that's an absolute minefield is the minefields. Uh, it's generally considered quite rude to sew your host's bathroom with underlino explosives and fail to clear them up before you leave. And lastly, do send a thank you note the next day. Something along the lines of, Dear Taliban, thank you for a simply wonderful occupation. We absolutely must not have you over to ours anytime soon. <laughs> um, if you just follow those simple rules, I think we wouldn't right. have got into this situation. Okay, uh, I mean, that's I mean, the great thing with etiquette, isn't it? It just gives you a, a guide through the difficult times. Yeah. And they've definitely been difficult times. <laughs> been difficult times. Yeah, Alice, uh, how have you how have you enjoyed the uh, the, the Afghanistan two, two decade I mean, the, the majority what? of your life on Earth? I mean, the declaration uh, that they will withdraw feels, uh, as Chris indicates, a little too a uh, little a little too late. They're planning to withdraw from Af Afghanistan. Well, withdrawal is actually surprisingly effective as a form of contraception, but it doesn't work when you've been. Someone for years and only decide to withdraw when they are well and truly impregnated with the consequences of your military action. We can all just uh, cross our fingers, hold our breaths, and uh, hope to see the geopolitical babies spawning into the future. It makes me wonder when America gave up on the idea of being world leaders by virtue of being, I don't know, better at the race of nations and committed themselves to fully just ankle tapping all major geographic regions that look like they might be acquiring any sort of, you know, togetherness or forward momentum. <laughs> Uh, President Biden has announced that after a conflict of almost 20 years uh, involving hundreds of thousands of deaths and injury, civilian and military untold disruption, the surprise and astonishing rise of the Afghanistan national cricket team up the international rankings and the steadfast <laughs> refusal of the Taliban to do the decent thing and f*** right off back to the Middle Ages where they came from. Uh, the American military will be withdrawing uh, by the 11th of September. Now, if the history of Afghanistan yeah. is a reliable guide, and the last 20 years suggest that it is probably the most reliable guide to anything in the world these days, then the official history of the campaign, its end and its aftermath, is not especially likely to conclude with the words, and they all lived happily ever after. Well, it, it strikes me, Andy, that because the withdrawal is based on two misapprehensions by the Americans in their agreement with the Taliban, isn't it? The first is that the pinky promise is recognised in international law. And second <laughs> is that the Taliban recognise international law. <laughs> They've just been going... The third is that the Americans recognise <laughs> Yeah, law. yeah, yeah. Fair point. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess if we've learned one thing from this, and uh, let's hope there is at least one, ideally more things, uh, is that when considering invading Afghanistan, read a history book first. But that was not the MO of America's president at the time, George W. Bush, the f 
acquitted John the Baptist to Donald Trump's <laughs> Jesus. And uh, Bush, Bush has her new book out this week of medium grade paintings of immigrants in America. And I mean, it's an awkward timing, to be honest, as Afghanistan hoves back <laughs> into the news that George W. Bush is publishing a, 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 a book of not especially impressive paintings. It's not clear if being forced to sit for a portrait painted by George W. Bush was one of the enhanced interrogation techniques developed under <laughs> his administration as part of the war on terror. But it could well have been. Confess to what we tell you you've done or you're going to have to do eight, ten-hour sittings for George. And, and yes, <laughs> when we say life means life, that applies not just to your likely prison sentence, if we ever get round to actually putting you in court, but also how he wants you to pose. Togs off. <laughs> Well, I mean, just as if we didn't need further um, concerning news, monkey humans are being bred in laboratories. Um, I mean, this is uh, really a sign that we're basically just giving up now, isn't it? And acknowledging that it's time for a full Planet of the Apes scenario. Um, scientists, them again, uh, have uh, been putting, um, uh, uh, making monkey embryos containing human cells. Uh, they're, I mean, these are scientists playing God with fire. Let's call it what it is. Um, and um, but there have been other mixed species embryos in previous experiments, um, including human cells implanted into pig embryos. I believe former Prime Minister David Cameron, more of whom uh, uh, <laughs> later in the show, was involved in some of the early research uh, on those projects, although I think the techniques were refined over time. Uh, Mon monkey human. I mean, do we see this as a as a positive move that that the fail the failing human genes could be improved by go going back to to our ape brethren and si sistren um, uh, to, to to find superior uh, makeup for our DNA moving forward. I hate this kind of story, Andy. Right. It always makes me confront the fact that I don't know how to pronounce chimeras, chimeras, chimeras. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about this. I would like to say I welcome our new ape human hybrid friends, neighbours and, and probably children. Um, I, I can <laughs> only hope that being brought up in clinical laboratories as organ farms for humans to use, that they will be bred to have more critical thinking skills than their human soon to be subjects. I, first of all, as I said, the, the news that monkey human hybrids have not yet successfully been released into the world will come as a surprise to any stand-ups who've done the Friday Late Show at Jonglers. That's the, that's the first thing. <laughs> Definitely, obviously, this sounds like a good idea because which of us hasn't dreamed of creating a monkey-human hybrid army to help us with, e.g., personal security, housework, and just, you know, when we get a bit lonely? You know, no, I'm saying we've all seen Helena Bonham Carter in Planet of the Apes. But the, the problem is that if the past year has taught us anything, Andy, it's that science just can't keep a lid on things. One day you're in your Wuhan lab trying to win a bet about whether you can engineer a novel coronavirus. The next, millions of people are dead and the ones who aren't are booking two-hour slots to go and sit in a freezing beer garden on a Tuesday afternoon just to break the f***ing monotony. So there is absolutely no chance that the monkey humans are not going to escape from the lab and start breeding. It's going to be like the past parakeets all over again if parakeets sat in trees flinging turds at passers-by that's my concern <laughs> i'm sure they can be trained to to do that the parakeets we've got we've got some corkers around here in the in stress you used to live in streatham of course didn't you? When, uh, yes. when i first you lived just up the road from where i i, yeah. Yeah, I mean the parakeets here are spectacular the they always look a little confused as if they're slightly aware that <laughs> something be. that colorful has no business in britain I think the, pro the problem here, as I see it, is too many scientists, not enough boffins, right? <laughs> what, whatever happened to boffins? Because we used to hear a lot about boffins, but they're yeah. not so much these days. Boffins are fundamentally benign, adorable <laughs> klutzes in white lab coats with haircuts not dissimilar to yours, Andy, right. who engage in colourful yet harmless research and or winning World War II and or designing a monorail. Any subconscious desires that they might have to create projects that threaten the very existence of humankind are usually stymied by the fact the boffins can't really get anything very much done because they get too shy and tongue-tied around their brilliant and bustily attractive lab assistant, Miss Phelps, and or surprisingly hunky lab assistant, Carruthers. Scientists, on the other hand, are ruthlessly efficient, amoral fact trufflers with the cold, dead eyes of Paul Hollywood. There's no project that they won't take on, however questionable. They create robot police dogs they developed the technology that gave us twitter and they andy invented gravity which is the number one cause of people falling over and toast going on the floor so bring back boffins 
And all this will, this kind of stuff won't happen anymore. Amen. Amen. This is an unbearably good debut show, Chris. I'm heartbroken. <laughs> I'm working on my own solo show. I thought I'd just phone this one in. Well, I've I've not I've not written anything for 15 years. I've had a lot of time to think. <laughs> well, if it's year beginning and ending in any number, there's probably a lobbying scandal going on here in the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, well, it's involving David Cameron. Uh, this time the hypocrite's hypocrite, the reigning British chaos causer of the year. And he stepped up his campaign to scoop the tide for a record sixth consecutive year by getting involved in a sleepy, sleaziest lobbying hoo-ha concerning the catchily named coronavirus large business interruption loan scheme, all full bills. <laughs> Uh, uh, as well as involving a collapsed finance firm, a civil servant who seems to have been simultaneously moonlighting for that finance firm and mooning at the concept of conflict of interest. Um, he's been sending desperate begging texts to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who didn't uh, reply with the f*** you that uh, seemed appropriate. And uh, Cameron's own finely honed catastrophic lack of judgement has been uh, brought back <laughs> another bit of old nostalgia from political times gone past. All as savoury as a sugary meringue-based dessert. And like the other Eden mess, the longer this one stays out in the sun, the less appetising it gets. When he became prime, he sort of pledged to clamp down on political sleaze. And he didn't so much clamp down on it as leap into its arms and kiss it firmly on the mouth. I mean, absolutely. I mean, by clamp down, he meant do his kegels. (laughs) (laughs) Family. Do you know what? I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that word out loud. It's, na- it's, it's right. nice to know how to pronounce that. It's your shimmerer. It's my shimmerer, yeah. <laughs> shimmerer Kegel. I was at go- school with a girl called Shimmerer Kegel. <laughs> <laughs> You're fitting right in, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, when David Cameron came to power, Chris, in 2010, on that, no, that, no, that night where we were on the radio with John Pienaar, yes, indeed. Um, he said uh, that year, in this party we believe in competition, not cronyism. Uh, which, with hindsight, is like hearing a 1970s priest saying, we believe in God, not institutionalised mass abuse. <laughs> uh, Cameron was also photographed hanging out with Lex Greensill and the renowned assassination fan and independent journalism sceptic Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, so, I mean, Cameron's proved to be, when it comes to, 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 to lobbying, not so much gamekeep not so much gamekeeper turned poacher as poacher who used to pretend he was actually a conversationist now admitting actually I just love the look of fear in the eyes of a rhinoceros when you stand over it with a cock machine gun saying look at me look at me you horny snouted loser look at me rhinoceroses the unicorns of reality (laughs) that's great that's a really good that's a really good metaphor isn't it this is your expectation. This is real life. I tell you what, it's been another cracking week in uh, David Cameron's ongoing crusade to eradicate shame from British public life. He is uh, very much the front runner to go home with the coveted statuette of two massive brass balls at this year's fewest f**ks given awards. Uh, he has been using uh, backside Cameron, who is, I mean, yeah, the one man economic downturn, a man who looks like a freeze frame of a pork chop exploding, a man <laughs> who looks like the main character in a Pixar film called Dave about an anthropomorphised drink problem. A man who looks like a (laughs) reboot of The Fly in which Piers Morgan accidentally teleports himself at the same time as a bin bag full of strawberry yoghurt. Anyway, (laughs) he... The fact that he... That Greensill advised him when he was catastrophically Prime Minister, then he advised Greensill when he was catastrophically head of a financial services company. It's just one more example of how the current British government and their cronies are essentially the world's longest running continuous experiment into the Kruger-Dunning effect. They are too (laughs) stupid to know how stupid they are. To a man, woman and barely functioning collection of cells and nerve impulses, they are remarkable. They have the unshakable self-confidence of people who wouldn't stop if you walked in on them wanking and the kind of absolute <laughs> lack of knowledge of their own grave limitations you would normally associate with contestants in the early rounds of X Factor. Take, for example, Andy, Matt Hancock, a man who looks like he knows where Anne Frank is hiding and is absolutely desperate to tell the man over there in uniform. It emerged this week that his sister owns a firm that was given an NHS contract and that Hancock himself took a 15% share in the company two months previously and failed to declare any of that, thinking that no one would notice. A government spokesman said, and I am paraphrasing, but only slightly, 
Nothing to see here, everything is completely normal and exactly as it should be. Other occasions on which this response would be equally accurate and appropriate include the last flight of the Hindenburg, the 2011 <laughs> Fukushima nuclear reactor health and safety checkup, and Jeffrey Epstein's autopsy. It is a f shambles <laughs> from soup to nuts. <laughs> Anyway, returning to to Britain, and, and we must uh, touch on on this story this week. This week, uh, Britain has bidden farewell to a giant figure in public life, a selfless servant of the country, an exemplar of quiet dignity, wisdom, and commitment, who strove to make the United Kingdom and indeed the world a better place uh, to live in. A true inspiration to many, whose uh, extraordinary life spanned almost a century, and whose contribution to the nation encompassed the decades from the post-war era to the present day. The sad death of politician Shirley Williams has hit this country very hard. <laughs> but we also had Prince Philip's oh. funeral on uh, on Saturday, the social event of the year. Uh, so far, the tabloid press were so stricken by grief they were barely able to write 30 articles a day slamming Prince Harry and his insufficiently British wife. And it was impressive in the circumstances that despite their pain, they heroically managed to combine their funeral coverage with slamming Harry and Meghan for uh, an incredible range of, uh, of perceived infractions. Um, uh, Alice, how do, how's the... Uh, obviously, you know, Pr Prince Philip was... Um, uh, y your uh, de facto king in Australia, as as, mu as much as ours, H how is Australia co coping with with the? Well, loss? certainly we are slightly less than the UK, but we're negotiating the delicate process as you know, p public figures and comedians of of what to say and and whom we might be offending uh, by saying, you know, for example, drawing attention to to things that Prince Philip has done or said or thought or uh, been seen to do in the past. Um, but really, I feel like this is an, a, sort of a, a blown up worry that everyone's worried about uh, upsetting or offending or speaking ill of the dead because really isn't saying the worst possible thing at the worst possible time the best possible <laughs> tribute to a giant among men. Yeah. Will anybody ever be as good at that again as him? We've seen the passing of something, I think passing of the culture the big news in, in global royal circles now is that uh, now that the, the, the funeral's happened Andy um, uh, and Prince Philip's wish to be made into bullets and fired into unsuspecting wildlife has been observed the Queen is back on the market uh, it's been a 73 year drought for people hoping to marry Elizabeth II but like Halley's Comet the opportunity comes around every three quarters of a century by now the new Lord Chamberlain what <laughs> If they don't make David Attenborough king, I will be furious. Well, I don't know that that's how it works within a monarchy. But I'll t look, I'll tell you what, right? Let's just let's just go through a few of the people. Just don't bring this back round to Putin. That's I just beg you. I just beg. <laughs> don't don't do that. <laughs> Why doesn't she? No, no, that wasn't what I was going to say. What I was going to say was, you know, obviously, eventually she's going to get tipsy with her girlfriends in a weather spoon. They're going to put the ruler app on her smartphone, uh, and they're going to persuade her it's time to get back in the side saddle. So, who are a few of the people? Who are some of the profiles that are going to be coming up that she could? get up with now so first up Harold V of Norway uh, at 84 years old Harold will be something of a toy boy for the nonagenarian monarchical singleton sadly there is a small problem that he's already married although given that he and his wife only wed in 1968 that 53 year old union Andy has pretty shallow roots by the Queen's standards and there's absolutely yeah. no reason she couldn't subtly drive a wedge between the young lovers <laughs> offer a shoulder to cry on and just wait for Harold to come to mama Norway seems like a natural territorial acquisition for Elizabeth too as she's very used to ruling countries countries with unenviable weather and self-harming attitudes towards the European Union. Swipe right. Uh, Vajira Longcorn, King of Thailand, at a sprightly 68, he's still an absolute lad and a ledge. He's certainly got an eye for the ladies and will go after any bit of ermine-trimmed skirt he can, having married four wives over the last 44 years. He sure knows where to put his orbs and scepter, if you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, I was referring to his cock and balls. He currently has two wives, although one of them is technically a concubine, a dangerous choice given that their spines can really hurt you during sex but would the queen really be prepared to share attention with two other women or four if you include Meghan Markle and the late Princess Diana not to mention the fact that a palace in Bangkok is maybe not the best acquisition for a family that's trying to keep Prince Andrew on the leash swipe left Pope Francis what that's right Pope Francis because Big Frank is not only head of Catholicism the world's campus religion and second largest user of gold paint after the contestants on RuPaul's Drag Race He's also sovereign of Vatican City State, which is the geopolitical equivalent of owning the freehold on a beach 
beach hut and calling yourself a homeowner. Vatican City State is so small that most of the maps of it are full scale. It's lacking in certain amenities, airports, a public transportation system, hospitals, etc. But on the other hand, it's bits of it that are a church to bits of it that are not a church ratio is comfortingly high for anyone who is either religious or likes candles. Pope Francis and the Queen have much in common, mainly dresses, hats and waving at people from balconies, but the real attraction would be the opportunity finally to finish what Henry VIII started and absorb the rest of the Catholic world into the Church of England as God herself always intended. <laughs> swipe right, swipe left, swipe up, swipe down, in nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. <laughs> I give up comedy. <laughs> uh, that brings us to the end uh, of this week's Bugle. I'm afraid our dinosaur reassessment se- section has been postponed, as uh, <laughs> has our early coverage of uh, the, the football crisis uh, that we will touch on. Um, dinosaur news is never really breaking news. Yeah, really. No, yes. not really. Not really. <laughs> the I mean, shit we missed for a million years. <laughs> <laughs> There's no urgency to it, is there? Um, we will uh, touch on them in uh, in future weeks. Um, thanks, as always, to uh, Alice Fraser, uh, who's now finished at the Melbourne uh, Comedy Festival. Any more shows coming up? Yes, I will be doing shows at the Sydney Comedy Festival. Kronos, my new solo show, uh, is available there. I uh, will probably be streaming it again to my Patreon subscribers, patreon.com slash Alice Fraser. And I have a podcast or two under the Bugle umbrella, uh, The Last Post, which we are doing a live show of next. The next episode of The Last Post will be live and you can get tickets on thebuglepodcast.com. Click on the live link. Also The Gargle, which is the weekly glossy magazine to the Bugle's audio newspaper for a visual world. And the live um, Last Post show is this coming Sunday, the 25th of April. Is it good? 8pm UK time. Chris, Chris is giving it the nod. I'm so impressed that you got there, Andy. That's wonderful. Well done. And the (laughs) guests will be me and... John Luke Roberts. Oh, John Luke Roberts. There we go. (laughs) Chris, anything to plug? Yeah, uh, yes, the uh, second series of the TV show that I make with uh, Simon Blackwell and Martin Freeman called Breeders is currently on FX for uh, our American listeners and FX on Hulu. It's on every Monday night uh, and you can catch up on FX on Hulu. And for uh, British listeners, it is on next month on Sky um, at some point and it's on various places around the world that they don't tell me about. (laughs) <laughs> what do you mean as in places around the world they don't tell you about because you're British and there's only certain places in the world that we learn about at school which are the yes the, well they, they, they don't tell me just in case it freaks me out the idea that <laughs> <laughs> That, uh, also, I think you just don't want to tell British people that their culture is go is being accepted and uh, somewhere further abroad, just in case you take it as a cue to invade. So, yes, of course. You know, it, it's it's simply a safety procedure. And if you want to listen to the department featuring uh, Chris, oh. <laughs> me and John Oliver from the distant past, I think someone put it somewhere on the internet. Did they? Yes. I'd like I'd like to re-listen to those. I wonder what that would be yes. like. Well, they're still funny, I think. Yeah, yeah. We could have a live yeah. listening party on Twitch. That would be good. <laughs> they're so dense. They're so full of jokes. There's, there's a lot of jokes in There's a shows. lot of jokes in those, in those shows. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll make the TV show one day, Andy. One day. That's what we have been saying that now for, I think, 18 years. Yeah, 18 years, yeah. Yeah, good. Um, anyway, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, do come back oh. soon. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. It's been a, it's, it's a treat after 13 years to, to, to get to come and do this. <laughs> Uh, We'll be back next week, Buglers. Until then, we will play you out with some lies about our premium-level voluntary subscribers uh, to join them and have a lie told about you. Um, Join the uh, Bugle voluntary subscription scheme uh, at thebuglepodcast.com. Click the donate button. You can also give a one-off or recurring donation of any size to keep this show free, flourishing, independent, and without adverts. Goodbye. Picking up on the monkey-human hybrid story from this week's Bugle, Charlie Pearson suggests a better crossbreeding scheme for humans would be with cockroaches. Cockroaches can survive anything, according to their reputation, says Charlie. I reckon if we can splice their surviving anything DNA with our human skills, we could pollute the world to our heart's content and not have to worry about whether or not it would still be inhabitable. That could be a real boost for the financial markets. But David Irish is not so sure, and would instead recommend a human barracuda crossbreeding programme. 
If the sea levels do keep on rising, explains David, we might as well prepare ourselves for the inevitable and pick up some innate sea-dwelling skills. Also, barracudas are ugly bastards, which might help cure us of our obsession with personal grooming. Barracudas don't waste their time with special creams and cosmetic tinctures, and frankly, they're all the better for it, concludes David. Abhinav Merotra would go one step further than that even and try a three-prong hybridization strategy that cross-speciesizes humans with foxes, parrots and whales. We would end up as a terrific all-round species, says Abhinav, with added cunning plus a willingness to cut down on food waste by rifling through our own bins, a heightened ability to agree with each other just by repetition, and we could travel the world in an environmentally friendly manner by migrating across the oceans. Greg Blaug is having none of this. Good luck getting that one past the plankton rights lobby, Abinav, he scepticises. Greg himself would prefer a human, leopard, flying squirrel genetic cross splodging. I love trees and I've always fancied living up one, states Greg boldly. I'd also love to have leopard spots because, well, who wouldn't? And flying squirrels were onto the awesomeness of wingsuits way before we were. And finally, Curtis Edge is not particularly interested in crossbreeding humans with any other species because he is suspicious of words ending in the syllables Ellie. We always referred to the television as the telly when I was growing up, leading me to believe that all words ending in Ellie were similar shortenings. My politics tutor at university was thus disappointed when I submitted an essay on the influence in the development of modern political philosophy of the Renaissance diplomat and writer Niccolò Machiavellivision. Here endeth this week's lies. Goodbye.